Thank you. Actually, I, I want to thank the organisers for this, to give, for giving me a post-lunch slot on system reform. It's, um, I should try and canter through the various changes. Um, I did come across an interesting analogy, though, the other day, which was um, looking at the length of gestation for elephants, 22 months, pretty much the same length of time as, as the health and social care bill has been in the system. Um, well, we can now name the elephant in the room, and it's the Health and Social Care Act. Um, and it is something that, since the White Paper um, in 2010, we've actually been actively preparing for. So I'm going to talk you through um, a range of issues. You know, executives always get nervous when non-executives are put up to speak. So they've actually prepared 30 slides for me to go through today. Um, that's to keep me on message. Actually, many of the slides I hope will have very useful information, but Gillian will be re relieved to hear I'm not planning to talk to each of those slides. I will be racing through them. They will be in your packs later so that you, you, can, you can use them and reflect upon them. What I will be covering is the new commissioning system. So I'm not going to be looking at a whole range of the other issues like foundation trust status, um, like Public Health England. It's, it's looking at what, what the end state of the system will be in April 2013 and the stages that we've taken in London, um, which we hope will be a useful case study for people outside London as well. Lovely, isn't it? This is the end state of um, reform. Um, it is a complex chart. It's an incredibly complex chart. But hey, this is 10% of the entire GDP of, of the country spent on the health service. So maybe a little complexity is, is in order. Um, and actually, this is a considerable simplification of the current system. So it is complex. I'm not going to plough through, through all of that, um, but I think it is useful to, for you to have that in your packs in terms of this is what the system will look like in um, 12 and a half months' time. <clears throat> um, there are a number of key staging posts en route. Um, and there are three critical dates, three critical dates where we've established a series of milestones for reform. So... Well, from Sunday, 1st of April, um, all of the CCGs, the configurations of those in terms of geographic cov coverage and size and scale will be agreed, and that's what we'll be moving forward on. Um, all of the other bodies in the system will begin to exist from the 1st of April in shadow form. So that's the first staging po post um, in, in two or three days' time. Six months after that, the NHS National Commissioning Board, and I'll come back to each of these in slightly more detail, um, will have its operating model in place. The oper operating model is the way in which it will choose to do business. Um, and that's significant because the number of staff available for these central functions will be greatly reduced. So the operating model that they choose to go with will be incredibly significant at that point. And the shadow bodies, or the bodies that um, have been established, move out of the shadows and begin to function. So things like the Trust Development Agency, which will be overseeing trusts moving to Foundation Trust, come into force from the 1st of October. And there's a gradual transfer of functions from the existing parts of the system, like PCTs, like the Strategic Health Authorities, to these new bodies at both the national, regional, and local level. And then the end state, 1st of April 2013, D-Day. Um, we expect the majority of clinical commissioning groups to achieve full authorisation, and I'll talk about the different types of authorisation. Again, not in much detail, but just flag those up for you in a moment. Um, PCTs and strategic health authorities will um, be abolished at that point on the 1st of April 2013, so I shall go and live in the country. Um, and all of the functions will have transferred to the new organisations. There will be some transitional arrangements in place in terms of commissioning support functions, um, and not every trust 
in the country will have achieved foundation trust status by that point. Um, but everything should more or less be in place. So the architecture becomes apparent at that point. So the NHS Commissioning Board, another one of these fabulous graphs, but you can see this one is not as complex at all. And this brings us into what David Nicholson has characterised as the 1, 4 and 50 model for NHS Commissioning Board and for the other, uh, the way in which the other organisations like Public Health England will be structured. So one national body, four, we don't call them regions, um, they're called sectors. So, um, and I'll come on to those again in a little bit more detail. And then 50 field work offices, or roughly 50 field work offices, all with a, different, a slightly different range um, of functions. We are assuming that this new body will have one third, at least one third less staff um, than the current setup, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail about how that plays within a London context, because it's, it's a very dramatic shift in terms of the resource available to manage the system. The sector, so North, Midlands and East, South and London, the four regions that the SHAs have now been clustered into, um, will have a series of functions. Be, they will be Part of the, the central um, function of the operations directorate within the National Commissioning Board, um, they will be undertaking a, a, a limited number of direct commissioning functions um, and different processes. Again, within this new single operating model, there is a recognition with the reduction in the number of staff available to the system that the, that the top-down mo model of control and command, which the NHS has used since its inception, um, will have to shift and change. We have made this ask before, but we're making it again, and we're making it with more authority this time, we think. The local offices will have a particular role um, in terms of commissioning of primary care services. So, so the commissioning is, I'll talk about the role around, around primary care commissioning again in a little bit more detail. Um, and it's also about managing the board, the national commissioning board's relationships at a local level um, with other stakeholders um, from the police through to local authorities and, and, and so on. As ever, London will be different, um, partly because it's a geographically much more compact area and it's easier for relationships um, to be held together um, than, than the vast new super regions. But also there is a political difference in London. We have um, an elected mayor covering 32 different local authorities um, and so special arrangements and a special place for the mayor within London have been designed within, within the system. So a number of the London functions are different um, from those that will be happening in the other sectors. Clinical commissioning groups. Don't you just like, I, I couldn't have done these. I couldn't have done these. So thanks to my exec colleagues for, for, for designing these. The, 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 this side is current system. This is end state. This is simplification, honestly. Um, how a clinical commissioning group chooses to set itself up is for them, except that there are now a number of um, safeguards built in, into the system, minimum governance requirements, minimum competence requirements, all of which they have to pass before they get full authorization and access to the budget to commission services. Within London, this is the picture of the boroughs. And this is the um, process that we've gone through in terms of um, Pathfinder clinical commissioning groups. Um, this has 38 Pathfinder clinical commissioning groups. I believe that we're now, we are now, just before we go on to that critical date of 1st of April 2012, I think we'll have 32, which is um, remarkably similar to the number of PCTs we've got in London at present. 
NHS London has invested seven million in Pathfinder development, um, developing things like toolkits, etc., for clinical commissioning groups to um, look at the competences they need and, and support them with developing the skills in those areas. Um, the, and there's been a series of workshops and masterclasses. But for those of you outside London, um, all of those resources are publicly available. Um, one of the reasons that we wanted to do this as a London initiative was um, a do once and share philosophy so that we weren't repeating, um, but still leaving that flexibility for CCGs to be self-determining. This provides, there's, there have been a series of stages along the, route, uh, along the way where we have um, been encouraging and supporting CCGs to test their competence and viability. Um, I talked about the slide previously with the map of London, which had 38 CCGs on it. As I say, I think we're now at 32. Um, and this process of testing their competence, testing their viability, particularly their financial viability, has led to a consolidation of CCGs. I think when we first began this process back at the end of 2010, um, there were more than 60 interested or, or provisional CCGs across London. So much, much more locally focused clinical commissioning groups, but with the costs of um, infrastructure governance costs, the costs of having a, a set number of places, it was only viable to do that at a certain scale, which just happens to be a similar size to the old PCTs. That's the current map. That's only of interest if you're in London. Um, this graph shows how rapidly we are delegating the finance in the commissioning budgets across London. Um, we are expecting, um, as required by the operating, operating framework, that, that um, all budgets will be delegated um, across um, each of the CCGs. There are some specific challenges within a London context, which will be faced in other parts of the country, um, but they're certainly more acute in, in, in London. Um, the nicely named legacy debt, um, the fact that we've got a whole host of hospitals um, and trusts within London, which are sitting on major, major um, deficits and recurring deficits, um, and the fact that we've got a number of rather expensive private financial in initiative hospitals makes the transfer of some of these funds um, and the responsibility slightly more problematic. We're also having a number of quite dramatic service reconfigurations in London where we're trying to still drive an agenda of putting patient care closer to home. Um, all of these complicate some of the transfer, but we're still confident that we can achieve this by April 2013. This slide, and I'm not going to talk through the, the, the detailed process here, but this talks about the stages of authorization. And critically, clinical commissioning groups will be assessed at April 2013 um, under one of three categories. They'll either be auth authorized, fully authorized, with complete autonomy within the legislation to manage their budgets. They may have a conditional authorization. And thirdly, they are established but we don't yet trust them with the money. Um, that, we, we are hoping within a London context, will be zero, um, but we think there may be a significant number that will um, be authorised, but will have some conditions applied to the way in which they can spend their money. I think the important thing to say about all of this is it's not just about compliance. The NHS is really good at assurance frameworks and creating metrics to approve and assure different types of organizational change. Um, but the challenge for the clinical commissioning groups isn't only whether or not they can manage the current system. It's can they change the system to reflect the new and emerging needs of their communities. That's what the system change is supposed to deliver. And we can get lost in the tick boxes and the governance assurance and have they got a, a suitably qualified um, accountable officer, all of which are important, but we mustn't lose the, the big prize, which is actually changing the NHS to better reflect the needs of the population. 
So the goal with all of this is actually a more responsive and efficient NHS. Timelines, we do like our graphs. So I'm going to move on to this particular um, I think that, that it's important to, 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 this is commissioning support services. So PCTs currently provide commissioning support services. Um, and the bill envisages, or the act envisages, a new market in commission support. Um, parts of that market are incredibly well developed. Um, so IT services, um, the NHS by outsources that already. Um, HR, contract management, all of those are available for CCGs to buy from the private sector. But there are other parts of commissioning which are much less well developed within any other parts of the, outside all of the skills or many of the skills currently rest within PCTs. So that's needs assessments, that's understanding the clinical evidence base for commissioning decisions. Um, so it's turning information into intelligence. Um, much of that still sits within PCTs. So commissioning support service organisations will be established, they will sit initially within national, within the NHS commissioning board, um, and they are supposed to deliver their services in a way which is different from current PCTs. Um, they are supposed to be responsive to CCG needs. Um, the CCG is the consumer of their service. So it's a different model, but the skill sets um, are there. This is the way in which we're structuring it in London. Um, three CSSs um, which will um, cover South, North East and North West London. Different models, I know um, the sectors in other parts of the country are looking at different, at different models. Um, so commissioning support services, these are the key issues. These are the key characteristics that we'll be assessing them against. Um, customer focus, leadership focus, business focus and delivery focus. Again, look in your packs later to find out more detail about what we mean by those great words. So the key parts of the commissioning system, there are three key parts of the commissioning system that won't be delegated to clinical commissioning groups. So clinical commissioning groups will have the bulk of commissioning and they'll be supported by CSSs or the private sector in their commissioning decisions. But there are three key elements of the system that will, that will not be transferred. That's primary care commissioning, the commissioning of GP services themselves, specialised services, and I'll tell you a bit more about those, and public health. Gillian, two minutes, three minutes? Perfect. These slides will all be in your pack, so this is an incredibly fast and rapid run through. Um, primary care contracts are the payments um, to GPs for their services. Um, they will be managed by the... Um, the 50 field work offices that sit under the sector offices that sit under the National Commissioning Board. Number of staff in London are dropping from around 600 to provide that service to under 200. So it's a two-thirds reduction in the staff. Again, we will have to find new ways of contract management um, to make that a reality. There are 12,000 contracts which the 200 people will need, 12,000 12, current contracts which these 200 people will be required to manage. This slide represents a whole range of interventions which we're going through in London to support that transition. Far too detailed to talk through now, but really nice colours and pictures for you to look at later. Specialised commissioning. Another core area that's not being transferred to um, clinical commissioning groups. Specialised commissioning is focused on those cases that are low volume and high cost. At present, each of the regions has a specialised commissioning unit, and then for very complex, very high cost and very low volume cases, there's the National Commissioning Support Unit. Um, the need for this remains, 
but the future structure is still very much a work in progress. So, and public health. There is much that could be said here. Significant element, local authorities are taking over this responsibility via Public Health England. Um, we've given a financial allocation around this, um, but the systems are difficult for us to negotiate. The NHS is used to being top-down control and um, identifying, uh, telling people what to do. Local authorities are fiercely independent and are resisting that sort of level of instruction. So we're already having to find new ways of doing this just to manage the transition, let alone whatever the end state will be. An interesting graph, which I won't talk about. And on to the final um, set of slides. These are really the concluding comments, and the slides speak for themselves. But what I would like to say um, is that the scale of the reform agenda is massive, um, and all of this at a time when, as Steve rightly highlighted, we are seeking to take £20 billion out of the system. So it is a major, major challenge. But I did want to finish on a positive note. Um, there's much to do, and it's complex, and it's complicated, um, and some people are feeling demoralised because their, their organisations won't exist in a year's time. But there's actually much that's already been done in terms of making this transition real. And over the last few months, I've noticed a real passion and commitment within the system to deliver. I have seen GPs and um, managers working together, struggling through with this system. I've seen local authority chief executives beginning to understand what uh, Public Health England and the transition of that funding might mean for them. Um, so perhaps it's not going to have the same life as an elephant of 50 to 60 years, um, but at least I think that we have the opportunity to build some firm foundations for the NHS over the next 60 years so that it can not just survive, but it can thrive. Thank you.